לא? כן. It's my, um, it's my honor to welcome um, Mario Capo to our uh, SAC lecture series in 2015. Um, it's been a successful series so far. Um, it's great to have Mario here. Mario has um, been appointed last year the uh, visiting professor, sorry, he's been appointed the uh, Rainer Benham professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Uh, before he was uh, a visiting professor at uh, University of Yale in the US. And Mari graduated in uh, the early 80s, uh, 1983, uh, from Florence University, and then taken on uh, first uh, professor positions, tenure track positions in France uh, at the um, um, Ecole d'Architecture Saint-Etienne and Ecole d'Architecture uh, Paris-Lavillette. Um, and then moving to the US in the early 2000s, um, doing um, kind of research um, at, the, um, at the Getty Center as well as the Canadian Architecture Center in Montreal. Um, and in 2011, uh, he published the really kind of seminal book on kind of current state of architecture, uh, which was the alphabet and the algorithm, which I think most of you read in full or in excerpts. Um, what I find particularly interesting that uh, myself being ed educated in the late 90s, um, I just grew out of that uh, period uh, of theory in a way in architecture and we actually were provided with just techniques and very little theory and we didn't even ask for that. And it took yeah, another 10 years for me to kind of see Uh, theory coming in that was kind of matching the practicality of what we were dealing with, and that was in Mario's um, the alphabet and the algorithm. Um, what, I've, what I was provided with a kind of last bit of theory or kind of the closing remark of theory uh, was a short essay by, um, by Michael Speaks in 2000, um, which he wrote for the Archilab, where he recalled um, We call, recalled uh, Colin Rowe's uh, story of how modern architecture migrated from Europe to the US um, and as it migrated over the Atlantic, uh, lost its moral um, uh, impetus, so to say, and only the form arrived in the US and from there it then went into the world as uh, the international style. Uh, and Michael Speaks continues that um, continues that, uh, that story saying the same happened in the 70s and 80s when French and German uh, philosophy kind of made its way to the US, got translated into English, got absorbed to kind of critical theory and because it was suddenly packaged could be applied to all sorts of uh, modes of uh, cultural and artistic production. Um, and very late, so I think um, Mark, Mark, Wickley, uh, Mark Wickley remarked so that uh, architecture was probably the last discipline who then absorbed that theory in the early nine, late 80s, early 90s and took that on in the, uh, the postmodern movement. Um, and uh, as, as to, towards the end of that essay, then uh, Michael Speaks point out that um, actually the, the, the project of, again, matching form and theory um, didn't work out uh, so successfully. Um, as an alternative, architecture really embraced new modes of economy uh, in the early 2000s. That was seen as the way forward to really see kind of branding, um, technology, um, new e-commerce as the driving force, not only for, um, for economic uh, production, but also for cultural production, and to kind of see architects go that way. And what he pointed out was uh, that in reverse travel direction to modernism and theory, it was basically Rem's um, um, project to bring 
this kind of economic, opportunistic <coughs> endeavor with his observations from delirious New York, from the US back to Europe, and from the kind of Dutch movement, um, which we've seen in the 90s, kind of it perforated from there. Um, why I'm telling this story is obviously kind of Mario being educated uh, in Europe, going to the US, and nowadays kind of, I don't think this kind of travel direction is so unidirectional anymore, kind of going back and forth, having lived there for quite a while, having published there, and then his um, kind of writing being absorbed in the US as well as here. Um, I'm really looking forward to see what differences still are there between these kind of two territories. Um, and I think um, within the whole lecture series, it's also interesting to see um, that we had people like David Rui here uh, who, again, take a very different approach on uh, things that are emerging in um, kind of North American philosophy at the moment, which then are brought back to Europe with a slight delay, where in the US these things are already kind of, um, uh, kind of passed to a kind of second, second fall. So, so I'm really looking forward to um, Mario's lecture tonight, which is um, the style of big data. Please all welcome Mario Capo. Thank you for the generous introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you in advance for your patience in listening to what promises to be an extremely boring paper. And on top of that, my papers are normally quite boring, but tonight there is an additional predicament. I woke up this morning with a cut in my throat that's an expression. It means with a sore throat. And I took some aspirin, and I thought that would be enough. But apparently, it wasn't enough. And it may be that I completely lose my voice after 10 minutes. In that case, we shall shorten the lecture. And I will jump to the last page. You will, of course, not notice. And but I may have to stop to drink some water and have some Ricola in my bag. So let's try and let's see what happens. Thank you in, an, in advance for your understanding and patience. And also, I shall have to sit down to read. So the title is The Style of Big Data, which nobody knows what it is, because nobody knows what big data is. And don't expect me to tell you because I don't know that myself. Everyone is talking about big data, but there is no consensus on what big data means. And the term is being used today in many different fields to mean so many different things. In today's global media, the term big data is mostly used to refer to the capacity that some organizations have acquired to collect and exploit huge amounts of data, which they use to pry into our personal lives and to make astoundingly accurate, almost miraculous predictions on all kinds of social and even personal events. This is the dark side of big data. Is big data as big brother? And everyone, of course, is afraid of that. Yet, in the design professions, we have a somewhat friendlier view of big data. As we all know, the digital avant-garde has embraced the power of today's digital computation with great creative enthusiasm and with few political or ethical reservations. Today, even more than in the 90s, as reference was just made, Big data and computation in design are seen as a tool to create, calculate, and fabricate even freer and more complex architectural and structural forms. I understand the speaker you had here, Rui Klein, one of the two, but well, that's one, that's them. Um, 
this is, this is often seen by the digital avant-garde as a liberatory and even as a libertarian approach to design, a way to cope, manage, and even extol the capacity of some emergent or morphogenetic systems to self-organize above and beyond our traditional methods of design and control. Not surprisingly, today's digital avant-garde often inclines towards a new, neo-romantic style, sometimes neo-naturalistic, sometimes neo-expressionistic, sometimes biomimetic, and often a celebration of the complexity and indeterminacy, of the vitality and animation of inorganic matter. This Excuse me, is something wrong with my slides? Well, never mind. It's still more or less related to what I'm saying. <laughs> Evidently, this vitalistic and indeterministic view of big data, which is frequent today among the design professions, is the opposite of the hyper-deterministic view of big data that is common among economists and social scientists. The paradox is that economists use big data to diminish our freedom and to amputate our free will. And in the natural sciences, we use big data almost to animate and liberate inorganic matter. They use big data to make human life more predictable, more deterministic. We use big data to make, it, to make nature less predictable and more indeterminate. But at the origin of this bizarre paradox, to go back to where it all started, it may be worth going back to the original question. What did big data originally and technically mean? Take a deep brief and bear with me, because this will require a long and boring digression but it may also require, but I will check my slides because there is something not quite right here. No, it's still working <laughs> somehow. <coughs> Sorry. So, big data at the very beginning. In its most elementary technical meaning, the big data phenomenon simply refers to our capacity to collect, store and process increasing amounts of data. If that is the case, let me proceed to a bold extrapolation. Because to the limit, this may mean that ideally, if this is true, at some point in the future, an almost infinite amount of data will be recorded, transmitted, and retrieved almost at no cost. Note what I said almost twice because this state of zero cost recording and retrieving will always be technically impossible. But this is the trend, or the tendency, and the trend is going asymptotically this way. An equal simple technical side effect of this trend is that many traditional technologies of data compression will soon become unnecessary, as the cost of compressing the data, and sometimes losing some data in the process, will be more than the cost of keeping the data as found in its original state for a very long time, or even forever. If we say data compression technologies, we immediately think of JPEG or MP3. But let's think outside of the box of a second. If we step back from our immediate technological present and have a look at the bigger picture, we cannot fail to notice that so many technologies we use, including many cultural technologies that have been with us for a very long time, should be seen today as data compression technologies we invented over time to cope with a chronic shortage of data and of data processing power. Small data, as opposed to big data, was until very recently an inevitable material condition affecting all human endeavors at all times 
and in all places. Data have always been difficult to find and expensive to keep and process. Today, this chronic shortage of data, all of a sudden, has just ceased to be. Today, we have plenty of data, which costs almost nothing. As a result, many cultural technologies that we used in the past to compress the data are now technically useless. We just don't need them anymore. Let me show just a few evident examples. Think of that ingenious invention of Baroque mathematics, logarithms. I don't know how many in this room still studied logarithms at school, but I did because I'm old, and when I was going to school in the Middle Ages in Italy, we still studied logarithms for three months. And already at the time, I had some perplexities, and I thought, soon all this will be of no use, but it was no point. I had to study it all the same, because they told me that logarithms were invented in the 17th century to translate big numbers into small numbers, and the other way around. And crucially, logarithms translate the multiplication of two big numbers into the addition of two small numbers. And Laplace, who was the favorite mathematician of Napoleon I, famously said that logarithms by reducing to a few days, calculation that to have taken, would have taken many months, doubled the life of the astronomer. And we could add today, logarithms doubled the life of many 20th century engineers, who using a logarithmic slide rule, like this one, which is very similar, but not exactly the same, but my father always kept in his pocket, they could calculate almost everything in a matter of seconds. But would the use of logarithms and of logarithmic tables extend the life of my computer today? Not really. Normal desktop computers today, well, when I was to school, I soon could buy this little machine. It's a Texas instrument of 19... Pardon? Uh, I bought it in 1974, and it cost at the time 20,000 liras, which doesn't mean much these days. It was approximately the, the price of 20 pizzas. <laughs> it was not particularly expensive. And using this machine, you really don't need logarithms anymore. Think of having today's computer. Normal desktop computers today are so powerful that a few more digits in a number or a few multiplications in a line of script, in most cases, do not really make a difference in the sense that computation would not cost more or take longer because of that. Not surprisingly, today's engineers do not use logarithms any longer. Logarithms are a technology of data compression we don't need anymore. Uh, now, I'm sorry. I told you I had to apologize because I'm a bit feverish. Now I know why the images do not collate with the paper exactly. The images are right. The paper is not. <laughs> <laughs> so, should I revert to the original paper or should I continue with the new paper? Let me have a look. <laughs> the two papers are very similar. I am at the slide. Uh, yes, I think I can do that. You will listen to this paper another time. <laughs> These papers are made by interchangeable parts. And so, um, so that is the machine that, when I was a student, made logarithms obsolete. But the list of cultural technologies that have been with us for time immemorial, 
but which are being made obsolete by today's big data, is a much longer one. To take another example, which is closer to the daily life of the design professions. Scale drawings in plants, elevation, and sections have been the basic tool of a designer's trade since the Renaissance. And the geometrical rules of parallel projections were famously formalized by Gaspar Monge, we're back in France, in 1799, under the name of descriptive geometry. But seen in a historical perspective, and from today's vantage point, descriptive geometry is another cultural technology typical of a small data environment, as descriptive geometry compresses a big 3D object into a limited number of small flat drawings, which can be easily recorded, stored and transmitted as simple flat sheets of paper. In this instance, the data compression is also visible and physical one. No one could store the Seagram building in reality. It is, as you know, a very big building. But many offices could store, and many did in fact store, the batch of drawings necessary to make it, and in case of need, to remake it. Descriptive geometry allows us to compress a whole building into a few batches, or in this case, rolls of blueprints. Data compression technology. You take a big 3D object and you compress it into a small 2D flat planar projection. This is what descriptive geometry does so well. From big to small, from 3D to 2D data compression. It was a very good idea when it was invented, but today, Digital technologies allow us to store not only a huge number of flat planar drawings, but also a full 3D avatar of a building on a single memory chip, including all the data we need to simulate that building in virtual reality or to build it in full. And technologies already exist that allow us or designers to operate directly in 3D, hence avoiding the mediation of planar drawings and of all the geometrical projections underpinning them. In short, if a building can be entirely notated as a 3D model from the start, and the way to represent it change at all times based on need, in many cases we may no longer need planar two-dimensional projections, plans, elevation, and sections. Descriptive geometry, such a smart invention when Gaspar Monge came up with it in 1799, is today a cultural technology for data compression we don't need anymore. And in fact, as you may have noticed, most schools of architecture don't teach descriptive geometry anymore. Even though, since I still studied in the Middle Ages, I still studied descriptive geometries for two years. But that was a long time ago. Now, let me proceed uh, uh, one more step further with a bold extrapolation. Because from these examples, I could jump to a much bigger argument and claim that Western science as a whole, from its Greek's beginning, from Euclid and Aristotle, can be seen today, from our vantage point, as a lossy data compression technology developed to cope with a chronic shortage of data storage. As the data we could record and retrieve in the past were not many, we learned over time to use more and more abstract formulas to extrapolate and generalize patterns for the very few data we had. Syllogism, then equations, then mathematical functions are very effective technologies for data compressions, as they compress a huge number of events that happened in the past into a very short notation, as short as possible, so it can be more easily recorded and transmitted, which we can use to to do what? To predict the future. This is what science does. See, for example, this illustration taken from Galileo Galilei, last book, published in 1638. Galileo, one of the founders of modern science, made plenty of experiments to study the breaking of beams under load, such as that one. But today, we need not repeat any of his experiments, nor any other experiment, to determine how a beam will break, because generalizing from a huge number of experiments, we have obtained this very general 
laws. Very few clean lines of mathematical script, which describe all the beams that broke in the past and all that will break in the future under similar conditions. This is how modern science works, or worked. And it worked very well till now. Because let's put ourselves today in a big data frame of mind and assume that we can collect an almost infinite amount of data, keep them forever, search them at will, at no cost, which is what in the past we could never do, and today, all of a sudden, almost miraculously, we can. In that case, we can expect that for every event that we are trying to predict, we can find a huge archive of similar events that happened in the past, all duly notated and recorded, all searchable and retrievable. That's the Google approach to the world. In that case, for every future event, we could expect to Google an archive and find a precedent, a precise precedent. And the description of that past event would allow, allow us to predict the next one without any mathematical formula, without any function, without any calculation, nothing. Indeed, the spirit of big data, if there is one, is probably quite a simple one, and it reads this way. Yes, the slide is right. Whatever happened before, if it has been recorded, if it had been retrieved, will simply happen again, whenever the same condition reoccur. Simple, isn't it? But note that if that is the case, then Google, not Google as a technology, Google as a view of the world, Google as a paradigm, Google can replace Western science in its entirety. The whole notion of Western science, as it existed from Galileo till yesterday, can be replaced by search and retrieve. And note that this apparently wacky idea is not science fiction. This is already happening in some muted embryonic way in several branches of natural sciences, and more openly, for example, in weather forecasting. And even Wired, a few years ago, took notice. Once again, once again, this is the tendency of the directions today science is going, whether we like to admit it or not. And sure enough, even some philosophers of science have already started to investigate the matter with much perplexity and great reservations, as we could expect. For this is a major shift in our notion of science and the history of the scientific method. Using the big data approach to science, namely prediction by search and retrieval of precedent, instead of prediction by the transmission of formulaic abstraction, determinism is not abandoned, but it is employed at a new granular scale. Science, as we knew it, Galileo's science, Newton's science, tended to universal laws laws that apply to as many different cases as possible. Today's new science of big data is just the opposite. Using information retrieval and the search for precedent, big data causality can be applied to smaller and smaller sets. And it is at its best when the sets it refers to are the smallest. Indeed, the new science of big data only works in full where it does not refer to a class or set of events but when it applies to one specific individual case, the one we are looking for. This is what I would call the infinite granularity of big data prediction, a new science of singularities and of the individual event, where predictions do not apply to sets or classes of events in the aggregate, but only to one event or to another in particular. In social sciences, and in economics, this big data granularity means that instead of referring to generic groups, social and economic metrics will and can increasingly relate to specific, unique, individual cases. This means a brave new world where, for example, fixed prices will no longer exist, and as you may have noticed, this is already happening. And where to take another example, the notion of the cost 
of a medical insurance calculated as it is today in America, not in Europe, on the basis of actuarial statistical averages becomes meaningless because it will be possible to predict at a granular level that some individual will never need a medical insurance, so they should not buy it. And some will need too much of it, so no one is going to sell it to them. And this is a scary world because the individual that becomes the object of this new science of granular prediction is no longer a statistical abstraction as in modern science, but it becomes you and me and each one of us individually. But again, in the field of natural sciences, the picture is quite different and way more optimistic. Using the new method of granular retrieval of precedent, we are no longer limited to predicting vast and general patterns. We can, when we are lucky, try and predict smaller and smaller events, up to the most singular ones. For example, in architecture, we can model structural material at a much smaller, almost molecular scale. We can design variable property materials or quantify and take into account the infinite, minute singularities embedded in all natural materials, irregularities even, which modern science typically couldn't and wouldn't do. Using the granularity of big data, we may now model the structural behavior of each individual part in an hyper-complex 3D mesh, including the behavior of the one part we are interested in. Which one? The one that will fail, the first that will fail. That's the only one we really need to model. Used in this way, the new science of granular prediction does not constrain but liberates and, as I anticipated, almost animates inorganic matter. And sure enough, this new post-scientific granular method has already started to influence architectural and structural design in many ways and at various levels. Let's take an example we are all familiar with, the calculus-based digital spline. Calculus is another great invention of Baroque mathematics. And it is, in a sense, the ultimate small data technology because calculus compresses into a single short notation an infinite number of points. All the points that belong to one line, curve, or surface. So that's a parabola. On the parabola, there is an infinite number of points. How many? A huge number, an infinite number. But we need not write down each one of them individually. Because if we write down the function of the parabola, as I studied it at school a long time ago, and I think it is still notated that way, with two <coughs> variables, x and y, and three parameters, a, b, c, which become numbers at some point, with two letters, x, y, and three numbers, we can write down, write down all the points that belong to that parabola, all of them no one more, no one less. That's the magic of calculus. It's a very effective notation. In a single line, you write down the position in space of an infinite number of points. But this is the reason why it was so good when Leibniz and Newton invented it. But let's put ourselves again today into a big data frame of mind. And let's assume that we can have access again to unlimited, no cost, data storage and processing power. In that case, we could easily eliminate that synthetical mathematical notation, the function of a parabola, and write instead a very long dumb log, the list of the position in space of many points of that line, each one with two or three coordinates, two if it is flat, three if it is 3D. How many? Doesn't matter. As many as we need. Perhaps a huge number of them. The file will record the individual position in space of a cluster or cloud of points that may not appear to follow any rule or pattern, which in fact we would not need 
so long as each point is duly identified, tagged, and its position is known and measured and written down in two or three dimensions. So instead of a function, two letters, three numbers, we have a huge book with billions and billions of points, all notated in x, y, or x, y, z coordinates. And if we need more, we add more. There is no limit to the amount of data we put in the file. It is not our job. It's the job of a machine. And for the machine, it doesn't make any difference. This is the kind of stuff that humans don't like, but computers do well. A long time ago, we invented Euclidean geometry, dimension Euclidean points, and a bit later, continuous mathematical function to simplify nature and translate the complexity and the unruliness of nature into short, simple, elegantly compressed notations. Small data notations, notations made to measure for the human mind, notation we could write down, notation we could work with. But today's computers do not need any of that anymore. Computers work in one way, we work in another way. Our mind is hardwired for small data. Computers are hardwired for big data. So it is as wrong to make our mind work on big data as it is wrong to make a computer work on small data. Each one should work for that which it can do. And sure enough, some of today's digital designers have already discarded the small data calculus-based spline the Bezier spline, which is at the basis of the NURB, non-uniform rational B splines, which I presume all of you studied at school when you were kids, um, that was so important for the new digital style of the 90s. Digital designers today have started to use big data and computation to engage somehow the messy discreteness of nature as it is, in its pristine, raw state, without the mediation of elegant, streamlined mathematical notation. The messy point cloud and volumetric units of design and calculation that result from these processes are today increasingly shown in their apparently disjointed and fragmentary state. And the style resulting from this mode of composition is often called today voxelation or voxelization, either work. I googled both and they give the same amount of hits. So. This is one reason why today's digital style, increasingly rough, messy, and complex, already looks so different from the elegant style of spline modeling, and so different from the smooth sinuosity of a spline-dominated spline -dominated environment that defined the first digital intelligent design back in the 90s. That page doesn't come from the Middle Ages, it may appear to, but it was actually January 2001. Believe it or not, all that you see on the screen, no more than 15 years ago, was extremely hot and trendy and popular. Now, some people are still doing it. <laughs> but that's their problem. This was inaugurated only a few months ago. I don't know where. But most of today's architects are giving shape and form to the new sensibility and to the aesthetics of our time, not to the time of 20 years ago. Today, the time and age is the time and age of big data. And at the same time, these new forms and shape are also often the indexical trace of the new tools we are using. So it is a matter of sensitivity, it is a matter of emotion, it is a matter of feeling, but it is also a matter of the new tools we are using, which almost inevitably prompt us to work in a certain way, and no longer to work in that way. Let me mention briefly, to conclude, one additional argument that may, just may, corroborate my argument. A technical, a simple technical, almost pathetically banal, banally technical point. The shift from subtractive to additive fabrication technologies. 
In its present form, the distinction between subtractive and additive making, well, we didn't invent it. It actually, it is a very long story. It goes back to Leon Battista Alberti, who invented it. He wrote it in Latin, but he used exactly those terms in a book he wrote called On Sculpture around the mid of the 15th century. And Michelangelo, the guy who did that, you know, there is always a problem with his name because the American called it Michael Angelus, but his real name was Michelangelo. Now in France it's Michelangelo, so don't worry about that. But I mean that guy, the guy, he, you see his work on the screen. And he made this distinction between additive and subtractive fabrication technologies or sculpture in a document, in a letter he wrote in 1549. Now, famously, Michelangelo thought that only the effort of taking matter away from a block solid of stone, subtractive, was worthy of the name of sculpture. For him, additive was, you know, stupid. It was just like painting. Painting is additive, and if you do sculpture in an additive way, you're a fool. But that was in the Renaissance. In more recent times, Subtractive fabrication was the first to go digital. The CNC milling machine was the iconic tool of computer-based manufacturing in the 90s. And it was one of the technical protagonists of the new spline-nominated style of the time. That, which you see on the screen, is not any CNC milling machine. It is, or was, Greg Lean CNC milling machine, the one he had 15 years ago or 10 years ago in his office in Venice, um, not in Italy, in Los Angeles. 3D printing and fabrication technologies came a bit later. And they have taken the forefront of the digital design scene only in the last few years. Not yet. <laughs> Two years ago, uh, this is a, a discovery recently made. Sorry, a footnote. Do you know an American sitcom called The Big Bang Theory? Now, a few, evidently, I stumbled upon one episode of it. I didn't do it on purpose. But there was an episode of it entirely devoted to 3D printing. And I, I saw it, and I googled it to see the date of the first broadcast. It was January 2013. Two weeks later, President Barack Obama, early February 2013, he read his famous State of the Union address. It is the most important speech that President of the United States makes once a year, the State of the Union address. And two years ago, in February 2013, President Obama had a chapter on 3D printing. And you know what he said? I quote, 3D printing is, I quote the president, the revolutionary new technology that has the potential to change the way we make almost everything, end quote. Which is almost exactly the same that Sheldon said in the Big Bang Theory episode exactly two weeks before. <laughs> That's a bit fishy. <laughs> but anyway, it means that in 2013, everything was thinking of, 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 of 3D printing. And as it happens, off the cuff, don't write it down. But I think I know who wrote that paragraph. You know, there are ghost writers. And I think I know who's the one who wrote that chapter for President Obama. He didn't write it himself, of course. Unless, perhaps, if he had been watching the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> now, today, 3D printing is as influential for a new generation of digital designers uh -huh, as 3D milling was 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, it was CNC milling machines. Today, it is 3D printing. This is due to a number of developments in the technologies of manufacturing. But let me point out that the two processes are also based on contrary, indeed, incompatible informational logic. CNC milling may be as data rich as one wants to, or as the machine allows. But in the absence of signal, meaning in the case of no data input. Digital subtractive technologies will still work. If there is nothing going into the CNC milling machine, the milling machine will deliver a plain solid chunk of matter. In most cases, releasing the original 
surface in its pristine state, unmarked without any denting, milling, or, or, or amputation, because the data is the milling drill that takes matter out. No information in, nothing is taken out, and the block of whatever it is is not carved. So no information, no carving. To the contrary, in the case of additive technologies, each voxel must be printed. In the absence of signal, meaning in the case of zero data input, additive fabrication delivers nothing at all. This means that digital milling, in case of need, may do with few data or even with no data. And indeed, digital designers using subtractive technologies apply data to inform matter only as and where needed. To the contrary, 3D printing needs data and machine time for each voxel we make. This simple, this simple technical truism has some remarkable consequences. Let's consider this famous example of, now famous example, of monumental 3D printing, which you see on the screen, the Digital Grotto commissioned to Michael Hansmeier and Benjamin Dillenburger by Frac Orléans, which was shown at Frac Orléans in the summer of two years ago. Ah, 2013 was a good time for the 3D printing. By looking at it, we tend to think that the solid block into which the grotto appears to have been inscribed was carved to create the intricate details of the interior. And that this carving cost time and labor. This is not true. Because the grotto was not carved from a block in the old subtractive way. It was printed from dust, almost from nothing, in the additive way. As a result, the grotto we see, including all its intricate details was faster and cheaper than a plain full block of the same size. The grotto is cheaper than the full block because all the void inside of the grotto was not printed. If we want to print the plain full block, we must keep printing. And that means more work, more time, more money. This is rather counterintuitive if you look at this from the point of view of the history of, well, from the point of view of art history, even from the point of view of Western art history in its entirety. Because we tend to think that decoration or ornament is expensive. And the more decoration we want, the more we have to pay for it. But in the case of Hans Meyer's Grotto, the extraordinary amount of detail and ornament we see inside the grotto, oddly, made the grotto cheaper. Footnote. This is true only in theory. If we disregard the time and cost of designing the ornament, but this is our time, which as we know, is worth nothing. So all the same, the difference in theoretical terms is striking, indeed revolutionary. Since the beginning of modern times, indeed since the same Leon Battista Alberti already mentioned, Western architectural theory has developed a systematic notion of ornament as supplement. Ornament is something which is added on top of an object or of a building and which, we, which can be taken away if necessary. For example, for this reason, in John Ruskin's romantic theory, the beauty of an object is proportional to the amount of ornament that it displays. But for this very same reason, in the 20th century, modernists, Puritans, Taylorists of all sorts blamed ornament as waste, superfluity, and in Adolf Loh's famous slogan, a crime. Labor and capital thrown out of a window, money that should have been better spent in some other way. It now appears that these technical and cultural premises are simply not true anymore. In the age of big data and of 3D printing, decoration is no longer an addition, ornament is no longer a supplemental expense, hence the very same terms of decoration and ornament, predicated as they are on the traditional Western notion of ornament as supplement and superfluity do not apply anymore. 
And perhaps we should simply discard these terms together with the meanings they still convey. So it would appear, to sum up, and then too soon, that the age of big data in the natural sciences means more than totalitarian snooping and hyperdeterminism. Yes, totalitarian snooping and hyperdeterminism are a reality of our big data society. But for the design professions, big data also means a new science of infinite granularity, a new aesthetics of complexity, new technology of discretization, and the new political economy of ubiquitous decoration. In short, in short, in short, a complete reversal of all the architectural principles we have inherited from the 20th century and from 20th century modernism, but also, since we are in 2013, uh, 15, a complete reversal of many principles we have inherited from the first age of digital intelligent architecture. That was the age of small data, the age of spline making, the age of smoothness, the age of a CNC milling machine, the age of elegant streamlining, the age of the blob. All that is also already behind us. These are my last words. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Any question from the audience first? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my question is a bit about like this idea of like that we are leading in the design professions, the big data is actually driving towards this complexification and this aesthetics of complexity. And a bit the question is that exactly this point, like the use of the algorithm as a tool for like generating more complexity, and exactly the fact that you ended up on the idea of the ornament as a focus of it, on it, leads me to think that somehow there's a, I personally see a problem in today's design profession, which is this problem that the algorithm is used exactly to generate a complexity which is not necessarily understood and in a way kind of deployed consciously by the designer, let's say. And somehow there's some designers which are instead claiming to the idea of the use of the algorithm, not anymore as a tool for like complexity generation, but as a tool to kind of understand this gigantic mass of data and make sense of it, and then design there. Yeah. And so it is true that, as always, there is a disconnect between the technologies we are using and the critical categories we are still applying to make some sense out of them. For example, in the discussion of ornament and decoration, it is evident that we are misled by carrying over from the past the notion of ornament and decoration, which comes from the classical tradition, which makes perfect sense in the tectonic tradition of the West, which makes perfect sense in the still tectonic tradition of modernism. If you look at a Greek temple, at classical architecture and even at modernism with a tectonic idea that there is something which is structural, which you need, and something which is not structural, which you can take away. This is a simple test, which in many cases it works. If you take that column away from the Parthenon, it will collapse. So that column is not decoration, etc., etc. If we build today using 3D printing, if we use filaments, for example, the difference between a filament which is load-bearing and a filament which is not load-bearing is difficult to tell. In fact, it is almost impossible to tell because even if you model a complex mesh of filaments using the most advanced uh, finite element FEA, we don't get there. 
And so, in fact, we must come to the conclusion that there is a complexity in the object we can make that we cannot interpret in an engineering way, in a scientific way, and most likely not even in a cultural and aesthetic way. Many attempts are being made to come to terms with the complexities of today's big data tools in new aesthetic terms. And they are going, they're all around the place and they are going in all different directions. I will not quote any of them right now. Uh, we are trying, I'm trying myself, and it is happening right now. We can formulate the problem. It is evident that all the backlog of expectation that we are carrying over from our aesthetical tradition does not make sense if we try to explain what we can design and fabricate using today's tool. So we need to find new categories and a new science. We need a new kind of science to make it work, and we need a new kind of thinking to make it make sense to us. And we are still quite not yet there, either in the technical engineering field or in the aesthetical field. In the aesthetical field, it is even more distressing because all the attempts I see go back to the past. They borrow aesthetic paradigms from some wacky, godforsaken periods in the past, and they apply it to describe what's happening now. But if it is happening now, and we do not have a cultural framework to understand that today, how could the aesthetic of pre-Raphaelitism, for example, make sense? If it made some sense in 1860, and I doubt that it did back then, how could it make some sense today? So, we can formulate the problem. And it's at some point in time, someone will find, you know, it's the Big Bang, which has not yet happened. Thank you. Uh, thank you for one of your series of lectures that always give us a deep insight into the history of our culture yeah, because I think each time when you when something comes up you always link them you know with the larger history at all so what I'm asking you is what I think was interesting today is you clearly formulated that we in a different idea of how we are using data yeah? but what was beautiful is you showed that within the last idea of the spline, yeah, there also came a disciplinary problem with it, you know, that was different than the problem that we had in modernism, yeah, and for example, that had to do with the relationship of the parts to its larger whole, yeah, so that the, the idea of the single surface, the idea of the blob, yeah, not only was a different data set, but it was also becoming a different disciplinary problem in architecture. So from your uh, travels and uh, visiting schools, what kind of disciplinary problems are you seeing emerging by using now other data sets? Again, when the spline came of age, it was a fantastic idea. If we read the arguments that were made in 1993, 1994, 1995, to make some sense of it, that was pure genius. The mathematics of the spline had been around from 1958 or 59, or 60, or 61, and 62. Bézier and the Casteljo had found the mathematics at the time when they didn't even have a computer to run it on. It was a pure mathematician's dream. And they, as you know, you know the story, Bézier invented it for the Renault car maker and the Casteljo for the Citroën car maker. And of course, they presented it to the car makers and they said, what do we do with it? They said, nothing, we have no machines to use with mathematics. And so they published it in scientific journals, which is why Bézier and the Casteljo, or Renault and Citroën, never made a penny out of his mathematics, which at some point became integrated into spline modelers. And if you can manipulate a spline, a non-uniform rational B-spline, by clicking on the screen, it's an easy game, and it became, it was an easy game. But that game, overlapped with a vast set of pre-existing architectural ideas. It, it was 
I was not there. This is something I've studied in books. But if you put yourself in the shoes of what Peter Eisenman, the deconstructivist, Zaha did, the young Greg Lean working in Peter Eisenman's office were doing at that time, even before they knew what a spline was. But that was evident. The day when a spline would appear on the screen, they would start using it like crazy, and they did. It was the answer to the questions that Peter Eisman and others had been asking for some time. This is, by the way, the technical history of the invention of Form Z, to which Peter Eisman himself participated as a tool to create complexity. And there was at the time the great idea of Greg Lean that the blob was a way to overcome the opposition between the angularity and the deconstructivism and the visuality of postmodernism. So it was a synthetic bypass, almost an Hegelian mechanism of going beyond the opposition between the conflict of deconstructivism and the empathy of postmodernism with the spline, you can merge it all together. These were the 90s. That was that page we have seen on the screen. But if it was such a good idea in 1993, the argument is it is probably no longer such a good idea now because the mathematics of it was a very old mathematic. It went back to Leibniz, which is why the Deleuze connection made sense. But again, it is a small data tool. It simplifies things, which at the time, this is what they wanted to do. But if we put ourselves today, not in a big data technology, but in a big data frame of mind, influenced as we are by this new sensitivity, feeling and empathy, with a new universe of messiness and complexity, it is evident that we are trying to find a way to explain why we want to use a 3D printer, which today exists, to make a mess and not to make a spline. You can use a 3D printer to make a spline, but no one is doing it. So once again, I think that there is a, a feedback loop between a technological change, a cultural change, and a general, well, the philosophical loop is difficult to argue because all the attempts I've seen so far, including mine, are failures. So we, we, the, the loop is not yet closed. And perhaps only a historian can, will, will reconstruct it 10 years from now because the, the guys who were inventing the Deleuze connection in the early 90s did not know when they invented it, but they would change the course of architectural history in the West. This is something you can tell only 20 years later, or sometimes two centuries later. You know, why I'm, why I'm asking that is because of your connection also to Eisenman. For example, he would argue that within the digital, there was the problem that they didn't produce heterogeneous space. Yeah? It was still an homogeneous one. Yeah? Or, I mean, I'm, 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 why I'm picking these things out, uh, or when, when um, the question by Greg was with the blob, where he would say we don't have any more tectonics, meaning it's not any more geometry, how we put parts together. So, so I'm, I'm more wanting to ask from you what kind of architectural problem you see yeah, that might emerge as a thing. I mean, uh, for, for example, um, let's say I... Uh, I just recently got this idea that um, what you now interestingly said that the idea of making a character in relationship to composition, you know, a text that Roe wrote, that the spline could now do that. Yeah? So what do you see today? Yeah? Come, uh, how would you think architecturally might something change by the kind of projects you see around the world? That using now your uh, interest in other well, big data sets. If you want me to not to change my hat, I take away the hat of the historian and I put the new hat, which is a strange one, that of the prophet. <laughs> what I think is happening is what was not happening in the 90s. In the 90s there was a new technology which was importing and carrying over a pre-existing mathematics. It is simply what happened. The mathematics of the spline was already there. Calculus had been there for centuries. The Bezier spline had been there since the late 50s. With the new technology, we made that mathematics usable. So we used a new technology to implement, to facilitate, to amplify an old, modern, paradoxically, modern science. 
And today, we, with big data, we are really jumping into a, I quote, new kind of science. We are facing a new horizon of computability or calculability, which is no longer that of modern science. So my guess is that in the 90s, technology changed, but the science didn't. Today, the technology has not changed that much because it is just a quantitative increment. It is just becoming more powerful, but science is changing. So there is a certain symmetry. In the 90s, we have a new technology implementing, carrying over an old science. And today we have an old science, because after all it is 50 years old, 20 years old, which is becoming faster and cheaper to the point that we have gone through a quantitative threshold, which is bringing us to conceive of a new kind of science, and I quote the title of Stephen Wolfram, and you know, all our students, in, perhaps even here, are crazy about cellular automata. And so they try to read the book of, Steve, of Wolfram, which is titled A New Kind of Science. Are cellular automata a new kind of science? Not quite, but the title is good. Because we are moving to a new kind of science. But here I stop, because I'm not a prophet, I'm a historian. But Mario, you still, you still call your talk the style of big data. Yes. yes. So the talk is called The Style of Big Data, and does, does it have a style? It is no longer the style of the spline. No, that's clear, but it seems to me that, if I can try another thing. So all the data was all, always there, right? Everything was always there already. Um, yes, well, but if you cannot use it, it doesn't help. No, if you can't see it, yeah. you, you don't recognize it. No, because we always adapt our cultural Right. Technologies so, to the information which is available. Right, but the point, my point is simply that uh, it's simply our uh, given certain technologies, um, we discover what is then called big data. Well, big data is a vague notion. I, I simply use yeah. it to define a quantitative <laughs> increment which is bringing about a scientific turning point, which is the notion that. Increasingly, Wolfram is going to that direction. Epistemologists are increasingly going into that direction. The old way to anticipate the future using deterministic, causalistic science, the science of positivism, the science we studied at school. We observe a limited number of accidents or events that happened in the past. We extrapolate from them. Mm -hmm. We formalize and generalize. That is the Newton idea of the world. We define a law, a law of nature, which explains nature and allows us to anticipate the next event. It may still work, but increasingly, in many cases, for example, in weather forecasting, we don't work that way. Meteorologists have already discarded mathematics and they make more effective weather predictions in a big data Google way. Instead of modeling a finite element cube of atmosphere by describing it mathematically, by temperature, pressure, movement of wind, velocity, acceleration, whatever, which is the way we would have done it 20 years ago. We have huge archives of weather patterns, but satellites have been recording for the last 30 years. Almost every weather pattern which has been taking place on Earth for the last 50 years is recorded. When they see a weather pattern which they cannot predict well, they search in the archive. And the logic of prediction is don't calculate search. If it has happened before, and at some point they will find a precedent, it will happen again. So search and retrieval, Google instead of Newton. It's a big, it's a big change. We used to think of the world in Newtonian terms, but after all, but after all, postmodernism had already started to train us to a, to a discipline of indeterminacy, in non-casualism, if you read Deleuze, the paradox is that if you read another book which was so influential for the generation of the 90s, A Thousand Plateau, and the opposition that Deleuze made between the science, not the science, the know-how of the medieval craftsmen, what he called the nomad science, and the royal science of modern science, which is based on abstraction, generalization, 
units which are bigger and bigger, etc. Newton, Leibniz, etc. And this sympathy is all for the approximation, conflictuality, um, trial and error approach of a medieval craftsman. He is, even has a short passage on the builder of the Gothic cathedrals, which when we read the book in the 90s, we missed. But we should read it again now because it makes, because all that stuff that Gilles Deleuze interpreted in the past, now we can project it in the future. So this alternative to modern science, which Gilles Deleuze saw as an antecedent, as a precedent, as the pre-modern science, as the tradition of Western pre-scientific know-how, which was eliminated by the winning paradigm of modern science. And postmodernists were arguing ideologically, we don't like it. You may like it, you may not like it, but so long as it works, you use it. Today, it's not a matter of ideology. We have new tools that work better than the Newtonian tools. So it's not a matter of ideology. An engineer today would sympathize with Gilles Deleuze. They don't do it because they don't know who Gilles Deleuze is. But, if they... but it, I'm still wondering, because it seems to me that the style itself is basically the ability to maneuver through and with, according to some, some uh, preferences, whatever, however they are given, begin to select the data that becomes relevant. Yes, yes, of course. So, in, so the, whole, the whole question of involvement and intimacy seems to me to be more an involvement and intimacy with the uh, infinite number um, of data that, uh, that, it, that at any point is available and which one, after all, cannot use. And it, this is the moment when I sort of think that, yes, there may be styles, but those, <coughs> those, will, be, those will be fashions or expressions determined yes. by other things. It's like of Peter course. also intimates, there will be new disciplinary problems or at least new um, articulations of existing problems, but they will also pass. So the, the style, in fact, is not one of aesthetics. Other things will determine the aesthetics. And the style is, is rather a question of how you maneuver through that infinite scale. I use the style deliberately to retain all the negative connotations of the term. I don't refer to Patrick Schumacher here. I use the term style as it was normally used in art history. And think of the colleagues we know some of which have shown work, some of which I have known not shown work. They are not engineers. They do not often understand 100% and sometimes not even 25% the technology we're using. But what does it matter? We are designers. We are creators. We are makers. Our job is not to explain to the engineers what they should do, because they will never listen to us. Our job is to invent rhetorical forms that at some point can embody and express the spirit of a time. And if you do that, bingo. Frank Gehry and Greg Lynn did it in the 90s. And I have the feeling that someone is trying to do it again. But I cannot tell you yet who the winner is. <laughs> I guess that meant over, right? Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Mario. Thank you.